All right, so let's get started. More people will come in, obviously. So um, uh, let's continue to have Dr. Randall Owen from uh, the Department of Surgery and Division of Surgical Oncology. He's going to speak with us about uh, thyroid and parathyroid culture. Thank you for coming. Great, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. So I have no disclosures. Um, just a little background on my pathway. I did um, a general surgery residency in Montefiore, and then um, had the opportunity to do a head and neck uh, surgery fellowship also in Montefiore. Um, it so happened that uh, the funding for the fellowship ran out at the end of my fellowship, so I was the last fellow, which was to my advantage because my mentor and fellowship director couldn't survive without a junior person, so he hired me. So it turned into a seven-year fellowship, basically. And uh, he and I were partners for six years before he retired, um, and really, you know, learned ins and outs of head neck surgery and, and developed a, a referral base from from his referring docs as he as he phased out. Um, stayed there for four more years, then came to Mount Sinai in 2009. Uh, Barry and Adam and I came here the same month, September 09, to start. Uh, surgery uh, effort here. Uh, <clears throat> grew into five surgeons um, over that 10-year period, the last 10-year period, and then Barry and Abnet um, just recently moved on to become chairman of surgery at the University of Kentucky. Um, so that's that's how I've gotten to uh, be where I am, and we'll talk about um, uh, thyroid surgery. If time allows, we can Going to parathyroid surgery as well. If not, then you like the thyroid talk, you can ask me to come back sometime. All right, so um, <clears throat> just general indications for thyroid surgery are really three. Uh, one is compression, compressive symptoms, uh, airway or esophageal compression symptoms. Um, and, and, and really, you know, this varies quite a bit. I had a patient come in a couple weeks ago who collapsed at home. Um, you know, sometimes patients get diagnosed with sleep apnea or asthma, and really what they have is airway compression. And, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Sometimes, you know, patients that lie down flat will feel choking sensation and will feel shortness of breath, and it mimics CHF that, you know, they lie down and they will have to get short breath. So really they're feeling compression. Sometimes you can actually ask a patient, are you short of breath in your neck or your chest? And sometimes they can give you some idea as to whether or not you know, what's going on is actually in your neck. And then with esophagus you know, compression, sometimes they've changed their diet over time and they don't really realize it or, or tell you that. You know, they're really eating softer foods, more liquids. They have to wash down things. They really don't eat hard. So, on. so it, sometimes it's a little difficult to, to get those histories, but um, but you know, if, if you probe and ask deeper questions, uh, you can find out. This this X-ray is from a patient who came to the medicine clinic. Um, this is from Montefiore, and uh, was complaining of shortness of breath. And if you look, the trachea is here, and and very narrow. And this is all the thyroid mass over here that's compressing. It's amazing. She was a housekeeper from Peru, and, um, and she came in with uh, severe shortness of breath, although she was walking and you know, didn't have to come to the emergency room. Um, I examined her and found a great big thyroid mass, and then uh, did a fiber optic scope, and I've never seen this before or since, but looking past the vocal cords, I couldn't see tracheal lumen. All I saw was tumor on the inside of the trachea. Yeah, amazing. So we'll finish that story later. But um, secondly, hyperthyroidism uh, can be an indication for, for surgery. Um, you know, the standard treatment in the U.S. has generally been radioactive iodine ablation for hyperthyroidism. In Europe, it's usually been surgery, actually. Uh, but a lot of patients are choosing surgery, particularly uh, young women who who want to become pregnant, they don't want to wait and see if the RAI worked and then potentially have to go through another RAI and the whole time delaying their, uh, their pregnancy.
frequency. Um, a lot of patients actually have a, an aversion to having radiation, despite the fact that you can explain to them that it's really not that high of a dose, and there's no you know, great evidence for, for long-term uh, second malignancies. But um, uh, a lot of patients just decide they're long surgery. So, and surgery is very safe and effective, so it's a good, it's a good treatment option for, for hypothyroidism in selected patients. And then thyroid nodules is you know, what we see all the time, and especially now with all of the radiology that's being done. Um, you know, get a patient that was in a car accident and had an MRI of the neck, and it's all thyroid nodule. And so, or they have breast cancer and they have a PET scan, and something lit up in the thyroid. You know, this gets so many patients with incidental thyroid nodules. And so how we deal with that is, is really a, become an interesting question. Um, with, with hyperthyroidism in particular, uh, of course, most of these patients are, um, you know, have graves or have toxic multinodular goiters, and they need total thyroidectomies. But one interesting subset of patients is those with a single hyperfunctioning nodule. So it's actually really important in these patients to get a thyroid scan on them because if they have a solitary hyperfunctioning nodule, then they can be cured with a hemithyroidectomy, and then they don't need thyroid medication. So it's really important to know that in advance. If, if I see a patient with, uh, you know, with multiple nodules or just one nodule with hyperthyroidism, I always do a scan before I do surgery. Thyroid nodules um, are so common, um, up to 67% of adults, really half of people over 50 have thyroid nodules. They're that common. Um, and, and yet, the vast majority are benign. So, you know, obviously we're not taking out thyroids just for nodules. We need something more than that. Um, the, the single greatest uh, indication for surgery in these patients is an abnormal finding of aspiration biopsy, um, which you know we just do all the time in so many patients nowadays, and we'll talk about how to interpret those. Imaging studies are not usually definitive, uh, although we've come to rely more on ultrasound than we did in the past, um, and if we see several features of malignancy in ultrasound. Uh, then we can be pretty sure that it's malignant. Um, any one characteristic of a thyroid nodule that points to malignancy is usually not really enough to tell us. And certainly, we use FNA uh, even in patients in whom we really suspect of cancer uh, before taking any surgery. So, pre op evaluation or just evaluation uh, history. So, we want to know. Age, gender, family history of thyroid cancer. Did they have radiation exposure? I see a lot of patients from Ukraine that were there in 1986 when the Chernobyl happened. They're very aware of their high risk for thyroid cancer, and so they all know they have thyroid nodules and they've been surveilled. Um, <clears throat> so, hoarseness, dysphagia, dyspnea. Do you have any trouble breathing, swallowing, changing voice? Those are three questions I ask every um, and then on, on exam, um, the consistency of the nodule, the number of nodules, do they have any adenopathy, and then do they have vocal cord paralysis? So, you know, typically um, a fiber optic laryngoscopy shows us whether they have uh, paralysis of the vocal cords. And patients can have a completely normal voice and vocal cord paralysis. Sometimes uh, the other cord will come across the midline and oppose the paralyzed cord. So that um, you don't detect it, or the patient doesn't detect it. More often, if they have a paralyzed cord, you'll feel, you'll hear it change the voice, and they will. They'll be hoarse, but not always. Um, a mirror laryngoscopy can be done uh, in a, by an old-fashioned head and neck person like myself that knows how to use it. It's like a dental mirror. You put it in the back of the throat, with the headlight, you can see the vocal cords. So that's a useful example. Or now, actually, we can actually see the vocal cords on ultrasound. So we're actually doing laryngeal ultrasound as we do our own thyroid ultrasound on these patients and verify whether they have bilateral or vocal cord motion. Obviously, it's good to know if the TSH is normal, um, whether they're you know, euthyroid clinically, 
uh, whether we're treating them for hypothyroidism or whether we're treating them for cancer, uh, useful to know. And then if we're thinking cancer, um, <clears throat> it's, it's good to have a calcitonin level. CEA is also a marker for medullary thyroid carcinoma. Um, and then it's useful also to have a calcium level. Usually they have it in the system. Uh, just because they may have incidental hyperparathyroidism, and that's nice to know if we're going into the neck. So what about imaging? Um, if you're looking for uh, cancer, um, thyroid scans are really useless. Um, you know, the old teaching was, oh, it's a cold nodule in neck cancer, right? But the truth is only 10 or 15 percent of cold nodules are what other tests do we use in medicine where, you know, a positive test only gives you a 10% chance of malignancy? Okay. It's just not that useful. Um, <clears throat> MRI and CT can be useful if you have a, you know, a, a mass lesion, um, if you have uh, a lesion that you think is extending into the chest, and that uh, you may need to do a substernal uh, excision or even a sternotomy to, to get access to the, to the mass. Um, and to, to assess tracheal compression, but even more importantly, invasion. Uh, if you think there's a possibility of tracheal invasion, then uh, you need cross-sectional imaging. PET scan, not particularly useful uh, for, for thyroid nodules. Um, once in a while, we use it to follow patients with um, thyroid cancers that are metastatic or recurrent, uh, that are not responding well to radioactive iodine treatment. Uh, sometimes we can tell if they've de-differentiated by comparing a PET scan to a radioactive iodine scan. But what about ultrasound? Well, ultrasound is on the rise. Everybody's got ultrasounds now, and we're using it on everybody. Surgeons and nephrologists are really learning how to use this. So how do we know it's cancer? History, physical are important, of course. Um, ultrasound and FNA are really the key to telling us whether or not these patients have cancer. Um, and what, what are we looking at with thyroid malignancies? Most are well-differentiated papillary and follicular. Um, medullary cancers are actually less common than we thought before the SEER database came out. And now it's, it's really evident that it's more like 3% of thyroid cancers are medullaries. Um, most are still sporadic, but of course, since a quarter of them are familial associated with the MEN syndromes, we do need to get uh, uh, genetic testing and, and get a clear family history, rule out pheochromocytoma before operating on those patients. Uh, anaplastic is really uncommon, but unfortunately very lethal. Uh, and then lymphoma and metastatic tumors, uh, much less common. This is actually the uh, pathology specimen from the patient with the x-ray that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, and if you look, uh, so this is actually the normal left thyroid lobe. This is the right thyroid cancer, which is invaded into the trachea. So here's the trachea anteriorly. Here it is invaded on the right lateral aspect. Here it is posteriorly, and we've cut it to examine the specimen. But here you can see this cancer mass invading into the tracheal lumen. Okay, and so once you connect this to this, you can see that she was just breathing through a little slit of the trachea. Okay. Uh, and uh, in fact, she was a very challenging airway management case, right? because you can't just intubate her you know, run right into the tumor. Right? So, well, we put her on the operating table and give her a small amount of sedative, put local anesthesia in the wound, opened her neck under local, and then got into the trachea in the chest below the tumor, and then took an endotracheal tube and placed it through that tracheotomy below, below the tumor, put her to sleep, and then we had control. Then we did a tracheal resection along with the thyroidectomy. And then we're able to re anastomose the trachea. And she was able to do all right. She, she lived for several years before she eventually.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
even over a six year period of time as the, 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 uh, the committee members started to, to really process the data that we were getting and think about decreasing the risk that we're bringing to patients when we over treat them, either with surgery or radioactive iodine or both. Right? And realizing that the risk of most of these cancers is not as great as we thought it was. Now we have to start managing perception, right? Perception of the patient, of the, the doctors, right? They heard the word cancer. Oh my gosh, maximum treatment, right? But the truth is, we don't want to harm them by over treating, right? So, talk about that some more, but the four areas that the, the 2015 guidelines addressed were nodule risk stratification, nodal metastases, uh, extent of surgery, lobectomy versus total thyroid, and then radioactive iodine recommendation. So we'll go through these four. Here is their published ultrasound guidelines. Okay, so this wasn't even part of 2009. Ultrasound wasn't even part of risk stratification. 2015 recognizes that we're able to tell on ultrasound whether a lesion is risky or not. So looking down here at the bottom, you see this completely bland, benign cyst with no solid component. The chance of cancer is almost zero. And so whereas we previously would say, oh, it's greater than a centimeter biopsy, now we're saying observe. Okay? Then when you have these low suspicious lesions, which you know after you, after you get used to ultrasound all these patients, you start to recognize these patterns, of course. And here is where we have a spongiform uh, pattern, okay? And, and so these are very low risk lesions. They're intracapsular, there are no calcifications, there's no irregularity, okay? And so, unless it's over two centimeters, we actually don't have to buy abscess. All right, so then, what about low suspicion? Well, we're starting to see a solid nodule here, hypocoic nodule. This is a cyst, actually, with a solid component in it. Okay, that needs a biopsy, maybe when it gets up to 1.5 centimeters. These intermediate suspicious lesions, back to the standard, okay? Over one centimeter, they need to be biopsied. And then here you see stippled calcifications, here you see irregularity, here you see a metastatic node, here you see capsular invasion, okay? So these are almost certainly cancer, and of course they need to be biopsied to, to verify. In 2009, we really were not uh, not using ultrasound. Now we are. Okay, uh, active surveillance for small tumors, and they need small cancers here. Actually, not a possibility in 2009. In 2015, we are considering the possibility of watching patients with cancers less than a centimeter. Lobectomy for less than four centimeters in 2009. No, everybody with a thyroid cancer, particularly in the, in the two to four centimeter range, got a total thyroidectomy. Now we can actually do a lobectomy in those patients. Okay. <clears throat> Needle biopsy totally critical. Okay, and the the Bethesda criteria have standardized the way pathologists read these, which make it a lot easier for us to uh, interpret those data and to to study it as well. All right, so a, um, uh, a Bethesda 2 is benign, we can follow those patients. Bethesda 3 and 4 are in the gray zone. We're not sure if they're cancers or not. Uh, and so, you know, in general, we're either going to operate on them and take out the, the nodule for uh, diagnostic purposes, or actually, we now have the option of doing a genetic analysis. We can send off a second specimen and get a microarray uh, analysis of, of the tumor. Uh, and that can help us uh, decide for the patient, do you need a diagnostic lobectomy or thyroidectomy or computer? So that's actually become quite useful. Uh, category five, we really treat as a malignancy uh, until proven otherwise. And of course, a six is almost always a malignancy. So this is very helpful to guide. The, the genetic analyses, there are now a few companies that have sprung up um, that 
take our specimen, they run a, a microarray. There are some companies will actually send you which mutations uh, they see. So if they see a BRAF mutation, then that's very highly suspicious. The, the KRAS and NRAS mutations are kind of intermediate in, in suspicion. Um, they can show you not only um, uh, which mutations, but if there are gene rearrangements as well. And then they'll give you a percentage chance of cancer based on their data and their experience. There are other companies that will actually um, not give you the exact mutation, but they'll say that this microarray signature is a high risk for cancer or is a low risk for cancer. So we tend to like the ones that actually give you the, uh, the, the mutation so that there's a little bit more information there. Um, and, and it can be very helpful to either follow patients who don't really who really don't want surgery or who you don't want to operate on for whatever reason. Um, it can also be useful to tell us, you know, whether they have a cancer going into surgery. It's a little more controversial, but say a patient has a three centimeter uh, cancer uh, proven on genetic analysis and they have a BRAF mutation, then you might think about doing a total thyroidectomy on that patient, depending on all the other factors as well. So what are the guidelines saying about uh, lymph node micrometastases? Um, well, uh, that there is a local regional recurrence rate of up to 20% uh, in patients with micrometastases. But again, overall survival is unchanged. So as a surgeon, I'm thinking about not only survival, but also I don't want them to recur in the neck, right? I mean, you can tell a patient, oh, don't worry about recurrence. You know, it doesn't change prognosis or survival, but they still don't want a recurrence, right? You still have to go back and do a neck dissection at that point. So if they have enlarged lymph nodes, uh, if they have a very high-risk tumor, then I may do at least a central compartment or paratracheal lymph node dissection. Certainly if they have suspicious nodes in the lateral compartment along the jugular vein, then I'll biopsy beforehand. If I see cancer, I'm suspicious of cancer, then I'll take out that lymph some of the lateral nodes and do an actual lateral neck dissection, but it's not too common. So the, the big news, extent of surgery. Do, do we can we do lobectomies on patients um, that, that have a known cancer? It, you know, this kind of blew our minds, right? Uh, and certainly blows the patient's minds. I mean, we have a cancer of the thyroid, so take out the thyroid, right? Well, maybe not. Well, why not? Okay, what's the advantage of doing a lobectomy? Well, we only dissect one recurrent node. We don't have to dissect both recurrent nodes, right? So the risk of voice change and hoarseness goes down. And the risk of the catastrophe of a bilateral recurrent nerve paralysis and the potential need for a tracheostomy is limited, right? I mean, it's extremely rare, but it can happen. And if you think about who these reading these ATA guidelines, it's not just endocrine and head and neck surgeons, right? It's general surgeons, general ENT people out in the community who are maybe doing five or ten thyroids a year. Now those the patients that are seeing those kind of surgeons are at higher risk for complications. That's proven. We know that's true. And in fact, <coughs> we live in a bubble in New York City, right? We have all these highly trained specialists, but 80% of thyroid surgery in this country is done by, done by non-fellowship trained surgeons. So you got to think about, do we want 80% of patients being treated by non-fellowship trained surgeons? Do we want them to have bilateral dissections? That's risky, right? Hypoparathyroidism only happens if you do a total thyroidectomy. If you do a hemithyroidectomy and you accidentally knock out both parathyroids on that side, you still have two on the other side that are untouched. The patient's going to be fine. They're not going to be hypocalcemic. All right? And, you know, if, if you look at the, the various series of thyroidectomies, hypoparathyroidism is not that common, maybe 1% or 2%, right? particularly in experienced hands. But that one patient who you have who is severely hypocalcemic, you're getting vitamin D 
feeding you calcium, you're checking levels, they're calling you, it's miserable, right? So if you can avoid that, that's great. So be more conservative. And then, of course, it's actually the case that 90% of patients with the remaining thyroid health do not need thyroid hormone. It's interesting because they, they often come in at their post-op visit and say, are you going to check my TSH? Say, well, no. First of all, it's too soon. But secondly, even if your TSH was low a month or two from now, I want to give the remaining low time to compensate and to respond to that high TSH and see if you get to a point where you don't need medication. If I send a TSH on you, someone looks at it, and say, oh, TSH is 10. They need thyroid hormone. Now you're on thyroid hormone for the rest of your life, right? So I really use the clinical assessment for the patients. And unless at two months they're just wiped out, you know, they're gaining 10 pounds, their hair's falling out, they feel horrible, okay, you need thyroid hormone. Okay? But for most patients, I don't just check a TSH and start on thyroid hormone because 90% of them. And that's a big plus. I mean, a lot of, you, you know, I mean, some patients, they can't quite get on the right dose, you know, 88, six days a week, and then on Sunday, don't take a pill, you know what I mean? So if we can eliminate that and just, they've got their own thyroid gland, great. Okay. Well, what about total thyroidectomy? What's the advantage? Yes, probably a decreased local recurrence, right? So if patients have thyroid cancer, then the most likely place they're going to recur is in the contralateral lobe. Okay, but it's not that common, and it, has, and it actually doesn't change recurrence. If we need to give them radioactive iodine, we need to do a total thyroid. Okay. So if we know that pre-op, then we advise for a total thyroid. Um, Follow-up in these patients, right? So measuring a thyroid globulin on them and seeing if it's rising over Time can be useful to follow them long term. Same with RAI scan, right? If we, if we can scan them initially, we can scan them in a year or two to see if we see anything. But the truth is, both of those surveillance methods have never been shown to impact survival. So they make us feel better and they may be useful in certain patients, but we want to try to identify those patients pre op now and see if do, are we really going to want to follow these patients closely. If not, we don't need the total thyroid. Right? These three um, large studies really showed us minimal to no difference in survival with total thyroidectomy versus lobectomy. So the whole argument that you know, total thyroidectomy improves survival is really not Radioactive iodine is the last thing that the, the ATA guidelines really addressed. And they scaled back. They said, you know what? RAI is really not proven to improve survival rates in patients with routine thyroid cancers. Uh, and so, you know, going back to the previous slide, that means we don't have to do total thyroidectomies on a lot of patients. And we don't have to put these patients through radioactive iodine, which is kind of a big deal. You know, thyrogen, you have to go in for consultation, they have to be on a low iodine diet, they have to take two thyrogen shots, third day come in for the for the ablation, and then come back for scans. That's five visits at least right there, right? So you've got to think about compliance, then they can't be around small kids for a couple of days. Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. So, if they have known distant metastases, if they have gross extrathyroidal extension, tumor size greater than 4 centimeters, or greater than 5 metastatic nodes, then they need RAI. So, the big news, 2016, I don't know if you saw this article in the New York Times, but doctors reclassify a thyroid tumor. So, instead of the old language of encapsulated follicular variant papillary thyroid carcinoma. This particular subset of cancers is now called the NIFTP, <laughs> a non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features.
features. Right? Our snow was gone. Right? So just, just remember that. Nif not nifty, nifty. Right? <laughs> So, so probably out of the sixty-five thousand patients diagnosed with quote cancer every year, ten thousand now actually don't have cancer anymore. You know, and, and this is really important. I mean, changing the language around thyroid cancer is really useful, right? If we can tell a patient it's actually not cancer, that just makes a huge difference, right? I mean, it, you know, it's like there's before I got married and after I got married. There's before I had kids and after I had kids. Before I had cancer and after I had cancer, right? Now it's not the case, right? So huge difference in their mentality in their ability to think about how to best treat their disease. Certainly a lobectomy is very sufficient. There are now trials underway to observe thyroid cancers that are less than a centimeter. Biopsy done, biopsy proven, PTC. Japan's way ahead of us on this. They've been doing surveillance for uh, small thyroid cancers for a couple decades now. They've shown good results. Um, obviously, you have to pick the patient. The patient actually has to pick themselves. So they, call, they have what's called maximalist and minimalist patients. I'm sure you know the difference, right? Patient who has cancer, they want everything done, take it out now, I can't wait, you know, when's your next availability? And then they have patients, we have patients who are like, surgery? Why do I need surgery? How many have you done? <laughs> <laughs> what are your results? What are the complications? Right? So, um, but the preliminary results in the U.S. trials are, are fake. Uh, so, summary of these of these guidelines, you know, for us, we need to really ask whether the patient has a good indication for surgery. Uh, ultrasound, uh, FNA to stratify, and then consider doing less surgery than we were doing before. We have developed some new techniques, particularly at this institution. Um, one of my partners, if you look at our uh, practice card there, you'll see uh, my other partners. Uh, Gustavo Fernandez Ravier uh, has uh, really trained uh, in transoral thyroidectomy. Uh, went to uh, Thailand and learned from the pioneer there, and now is one of the major players in the U.S. on this. Three small incisions are made uh, in in between the lower teeth and the lower lip, uh, and three laparoscopic instruments are placed through the through the neck, uh, and and the uh, thyroid. Is that way. Uh, Dr. Hyun Sa is my other, uh, one of my other partners, and he did the first um, uh, breast and axillary approach robotic thyroidectomy in the United States. He also did the first neck dissection uh, with, the, with the, the robot for thyroid cancer in the United States. He did um, his endocrine fellowship at, at MGH, and then he did a six-month fellowship in Korea doing robotic thyroid surgery. And so he's developed those, that technique. Both of these techniques are, um, they take longer, they're a lot more instrumentation. We don't have as much experience with them as we do with open techniques. But if you have the patient who will not have surgery if they get a scar on their neck, you know, or it's really, really important to them, then these are options that are available for them and we're showing that they're safe and we talked about this a little bit, but just to, to let you know, there are data to show that high volume surgeons, meaning over 50 thyroid and parathyroid surgeries per year, definitely have better results. And so these are four surgeons who have that experience. Um, uh, Gustavo uh, fernandez Ramirez on the left, and Ida Taye um, um, to my left, um, on the, uh, the slide there, we're both our fellows here um, four and five years ago, and, and we recruited them. And then uh, Hyun uh, Sa, he had come through the interview trail. We really liked him um, and, and wanted him here and kept in touch with them. And then after he went to Korea, we recruited him back. Uh, so very proud of our team and uh, having a, a great time together academically as well as in terms of practice. And, and we're certainly available for you. 
Um, just a couple minutes on, on one other uh, passion of mine, which is uh, uh, developing world surgery. I had a chance to, uh, to travel and, and do a lot of surgery, particularly in Africa. This is a map showing a surgical access uh, in the world, and, and the red is, is poor surgical access. You can see the deep red here in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there is a, a, an organization that I've been working with called PACS, or the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, um, and they have developed a residency program for African medical school graduates and have graduated 100 African surgeons in the last 25 years. So they have um, uh, 12 sites in eight countries for uh, residency programs there in which uh, full-time and visiting faculty can come and teach surgery. Uh, I've been to Cameroon, Gabon, Kenya, and Egypt, and in April I'll be going to Niger um, to, to teach surgery. Here you can see the growth of the program. Um, here's where all the PACS graduates are working. Uh, really, they're screened for their desire to work in resource poor settings, uh, and that's where they're working in, in many states in, in Africa. Um, our uh, division here actually took a trip to Kenya last last year. Um, you can see uh, Irene, our fellow from last year. Uh, Jerome is a, a laparoscopic surgeon down at uh, MSBI. Uh, Rohan was our fellow um, five or six years ago. He's in practice in Florida, came with us. Hu Chen is an amazing cytopathologist who we work with, and they put him to work over there. And then here's uh, Barry in Abnet, our, our former endocrine surgery chief who is now in, in Kentucky. And we had the chance to go over there and attend their biannual resident conference and do teaching, where 55 PGRY1 and two residents came, teaching in hands-on skills training and then go to two different hospitals in Kenya and cover the surgeons there so that they can cover the conference. So we hope to go again uh, in 2021 uh, and repeat that uh, wonderful experience. Um, the conditions uh, in, in, these, in these locations are quite a bit different uh, than what we are used to and what we deal with here, uh, but it's amazing what, what you can actually do uh, when you learn from them uh, how to deal with the setting that they're in, and, and then there's a bilateral exchange. So I'll stop there and um, entertain any questions you have. I was just noticing also working with Tyrex. Right. Yeah, so, so that's, because again, those ones say, like, you know, those Tyrex, you know, follow. So that's, I always start seeing that, like, this last year or so. Yeah, a reflection of the changes here. Or? It is, it is, and and the you know radiology and ultrasound societies have kind of come alongside these ATA guidelines and, and trying to develop a more systematic way of, of reporting on these thyroid nodules, which is great because you know it's I mean previously we were not getting we were just getting number of nodules right. and size and that's it, and so we had no idea whether or not these looked suspicious. Uh, and we're having to do our own ultrasound on everybody. We still do, um, and you know, I mean, we get community ultrasounds that give us those kinds of reports or worse. Um, but to try to standardize it and give us a TIRADS, like what we're used to with, with breast imaging, uh, it is useful, for sure. Absolutely, sure. Definitely. I mean, in my practice, um, for sure, I'm doing a lot less total thyroidectomies, um, a lot more uh, probectomies on patients, uh, advising patients that they can observe that we don't have to biopsy everything. Um, so it's and and for sure in the you know the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons meeting, you can hear this the culture ro rolling out through through the society. And hopefully, you know, as we train more and more fellows, I mean, we have 25 fellowship programs um, across the U.S., Canada, and Australia. Um, this culture will, will change. And the robotic approaches are used for the low back and the table. Yeah. Correct. Do insurance companies take the robotics? 
they pay for a thyroidectomy. So we absorb a lot more cost. Mount Sinai absorbs a lot more cost because of the use of the robot and the laparoscopic instruments. Um, but, um, but now, you know, the word's out and patients come wanting that. Uh, and so, um, and, and, you know, we, we want to push the envelope. We want to develop the, the new technology and, uh, and, and see what we can do. I mean, you know, when we started doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy, everyone said, what are you doing? You know, it's so easy just to make this, you know, gash here under the rib. <laughs> you know, and, and now patients are in pain and in the hospital for four days, and you know, now they go home the same day. So, so you know, we don't want to be too critical of, of new technologies and um, see what, uh, what they might bring us as, as, as a So Sina has a lot of World Trade Center patients are involved. Are they treated any differently than your thyroid cancer? No. The, the, I mean, we see those patients, yeah. too. The World Trade Center patients, the in fact, the, um, the patients exposed to the Chernobyl um, outbreak, um, they have a higher rate of cancer, but their cancers are no more aggressive. So we, we really treat them the same. All right. Thanks very much.